Well, I want to welcome you all to Focal Point, a Sabbath school here at the Camelback Church. Just so glad that you're here with us today. And we have an exciting topic. I believe this is our 12th, number 12 in our lesson series. And uh, it is on the law of God. We want to approach it from a little different perspective than maybe some of you have heard before. But uh, certainly we will cover very important aspects from Scripture in regard to the law of God, specifically connected to God's character. And so uh, I invite you here as we begin to bow your heads and let us pray and allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this morning, for many blessings that you've given to us this week. And we just give ourselves to you and pray that you would teach us today through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I want to start off by talking about uh, government and law. Uh, a government is a social system of control over a state or community. The word comes from the Greek verb kubernau, meaning to steer as with a rudder. All governments maintain the right to make and enforce laws. God's government is no different. Of course, he's the model of government, whatever government, whatever government should be, but he is, it is no different. It starts with him. Uh, he has a law that is foundational to his throne, which is the throne of the universe. And so we can learn a lot from how God uh, governs uh, his law and how he not only um, does that law tie into his very nature and character, but uh, the way he enforces that law also is tied to his character, which is so important because today what we see around us are many governments that aren't really or, or aren't necessarily um, godly in nature. And so we don't want to repeat those, but certainly we want uh, to learn from what, God's, um, what God had in mind as he gave his law to, to us. And so uh, let's start here with this verse, Psalm chapter 97, verses 1 and 2. It says, The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of isles be glad. Clouds and darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of the very throne of God, referring to his government and how he, he rules the universe. Now, something happened a long time ago, even before this world was created, and that was rebellion by Lucifer in heaven. We've already gone, gone through a series or a lesson study on that rebellion, um, and that was, I think, on the fall of man fairly early on. Uh, I just want to touch base on that again from a little different perspective because Lucifer's rebellion does tell us a lot about the importance of God's law, the perpetuity or the eternal nature of God's law as well. So look what it says here in regard to Lucifer and his position in heaven way, way back when, even before his fall. It says in Ezekiel 28, verse 14, you were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in all your ways or in your ways from the day you were created until what happened? Iniquity was found in you. Speaking of iniquity starting in Satan himself, it took possession of him as he began to rebel against God. But notice a couple things in this passage that are very uh, evident here. Um, it speaks of Lucifer as being the anointed cherub who covers. The imagery there is very clear to any uh, Jew or, or Israelite uh, in that the, the, the cherub that covers is one that covers the Ark of the Covenant. And so uh, that covering oversees, or these, these two cherub come over the Ark of the Covenant, and they're looking down almost bowing down toward the container itself, the box of the Ark of the Covenant. And within that Ark of the Covenant is the very law of God. 
And so that's the imagery that would pop up to any Israelite that comes up. The anointed cherub who covers, speaking of Lucifer, that conjures up, wow, he was part of God's central system, his governance, uh, his law. I establish, I establish you, you were on the holy mountain of God. Another thing, uh, the holy mountain of God, that is a reference that's going to become clear as we look at a couple other verses here, but it's really that's, that's the epicenter of God's government. It's the mountain of God. And you walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. We'll cover that as well coming up. But that imagery there says everything about what Satan's rebellion was all about. It was about his rebellion against God, but even more than that, the focus was God's law. And it's no, uh, no surprise that it says that you were perfect until iniquity was found in you. And iniquity or transgression is, is against um, the law of the land or, or in our case, against God's law is what he was rebelling against. It goes on, the abundance of your trading became fill, you became filled with violence from within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. There it is again, the fiery stones. Uh, it's interesting, one of the reasons that the Ten Commandments were written in stone was to, to connotate the perpetuity or the eternal nature of the law of God. And so when you're talking about the fiery stones, what God is referring to is the central, um, the laws that are pertaining to his government. And uh, Satan's rebellion was against that law. And his rebellion contained an argument similar to this. God, you're unreasonable. You are restrictive. You are requiring us to keep something that is not fair. And so we're going to take our own system. This is in Satan's mind, and of course, what he was trading, that's the trading of ideas with the other angels. He was saying to them, we can get our own system together whereby our own government can then rule and control. And of course, the word there, the best word to describe that is rebellion because he was against the law of God, but that rebellion was against God himself. He wanted to separate from God's um, control or governance, uh, so to speak. Where is God's law first mentioned in the Bible? Well, we find that in Genesis 26, 5, that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So clearly Abraham, and this is long before Sinai and the Ten Commandments, Abraham understood God's law was important for his rule of life, how we should govern and control and order his life. And so it says that he obeyed God's voice by keeping his, his charge, commandments, statutes, and laws. So what happened at Mount Sinai? So now we're going to go a few hundred years later. What happened at Mount Sinai when the Lord came down and gave the Israelites the Ten Commandments that we understand or that we know uh, are in its form today in the scriptures. Uh, those Ten Commandments appear in two places. They appear in Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5. Uh, Exodus 20 is the event where God comes down on top of Mount Sinai and with a thunderous voice, th thunderous voice he proclaimed his, uh, his Ten Commandments to the people and they all heard them. But I want to I get a little bit backdrop to this story because it's important that we understand what is happening, because it's not so clear or evident from uh, the passage in Scripture uh, in its various translations. So let's take a look at this here for just a minute. It says, The Lord said to Moses, and this comes from Exodus 19, verse 10, right before the Ten Commandments are given from the top of the mountain in chapter 20. So it says, The Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today, tomorrow, and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes, and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Take heed to yourself that you do not go up the mountain or touch its base. 
Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow. With whether man or beast, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain. Okay, so we have a little bit of a, a challenge here with, with uh, the language and how it's, in, it's translated and so forth, but I want to just call attention to a couple things. Notice here that God says, I'm going to come down, and for, for three days, I want the people to consecrate themselves, right? It says, people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Let them wash their clothes. So they're getting ready for the third day. There's a three-day period of consecration. During that period, they, Moses is, should set bounds for the people all around saying, don't go up the mountain or touch its base. Okay, go ahead. What is what? Okay, consecrate is um, um, giving of oneself for the purpose of another. It's, it's dedicating. It's, it's a dedication of their life to God. So for those three days, they're to consecrate their life, they're to dedicate their lives to God. And in one respect, the Bible says, kind of purify themselves, get rid of the sin and the stuff that is holding them back and just give themselves totally to God, okay? And it makes sense because God's about to give them something very, very important, his law. So if that's happening, he wants them to be ready to receive that. This is, a, this is a pattern that repeats itself through Scripture. Get ready to receive what I'm about to give you. And uh, so that's, that's also happening here. But these bounds for all the people that are being set are being set during this time of consecration or dedication of the people. In other words, none of them are to go up onto the mountain or to touch the mountain before God calls them. And we know this is the case by this language at the end. It says, when the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain. Now, the interesting thing about this word, come near, translated in the New King James is what I'm reading here, is that word is Allah, or Allah, which is to ascend or go up. So even the translators, as they're reading this, they're not understanding here that the the boundary was during the consecration time, the dedication time. Once that was done and God proclaimed his law, the people were to ascend the mountain. So God calls them to go up the mountain at that time. We know this is the case because we can go to another scripture where Moses, in Deuteronomy, Moses is basically telling the, uh, all the, the Israelites how they should be faithful to God, how God has led them, what he has done for them, and, um, and he kind of almost, um, he articulates uh, or, or reinforces what God has told them through his law and statutes and other things through the law of Moses, not just the law of God, how they should obey those things. And so we're going to go to Deuteronomy and listen to these words from Moses. And this is in Deuteronomy 5, 2 through 5. Now, this is right before Moses reiterates the Ten Commandments, which is the second edition of the Ten Commandments that we find in Scripture. Uh, but anyway, he says these words in the opening of chapter 5. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Oreb. Horeb is Mount Sinai, okay? The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, those who are here today, all of us who are alive, the Lord talked with you face to face on the mountain from the midst of the fire. I stood between the Lord and you at that time to declare the, you, to you the word of the Lord. For what reason? For you were afraid because of the fire and you did not go up the mountain. In other words, God called you up the mountain after the, the, the consecration period, the three days, but you were afraid and you did not go up the mountain. So what we're seeing here is a little bit of a misunderstanding sometimes as taught in, um, uh, it's taught by many, by most, thinking that God never called them up the mountain. They were to stay away entirely and they were to fear God. But what God is saying is that no, they were to consecrate themselves, dedicate themselves for the three days, but then they were to freely come up the mountain to meet with God face to face, it says, but he says, you didn't go up 
because you were afraid. Now, herein is a very important lesson that we can understand from the law of God. The law of God is not intended to be a fearful thing. The law of God is intended to be something that we embrace as his people. And instead of the Israelites at that time, instead of coming up the mountain to embrace God's law and whatever he had in store for them after they consecrated themselves to him, they stayed away. They said, no, Moses, you go up. You talk to God or we're going to die. So they were afraid. And Moses is saying, you don't need to be afraid of the Lord. You need to be uh, fearful as far as have a very healthy respect for who God is and not just be frivolous about all the things that you do in front of him. But he's calling you into a relationship. Into, in, the word was covenant. Isn't that what we saw in the next thing? To make his covenant with our fathers. But that covenant, he, Moses says, is with us. So God called them into this covenant relationship with him, and he called them to come up the mountain to meet him. But instead, they were fearful and they stayed away. And how many times do we find that even in our own relationship with God, we can be fearful of him rather than just give ourselves to him, consecrate ourselves to him, but yet let him make us holy, draw near to him, and let him do what he wants to do for us in our lives. That's a huge lesson, I think, to learn. What I find often is people that resist the Ten Commandments or the law of God, whether they're resisting Christianity altogether or whether they're Christians themselves and they don't embrace that. Uh, there are many today that just say, oh, that's an old covenant thing. But when they do that, what they're most fearful of is the change that God wants to make in them. It's, the, it's almost like they're fearful of getting too close to allow that full effect of change that God had for them. I believe, this is that, what I think, this, now I'm giving you my personal opinion, I believe God was calling them up the mountain to write his law, not only to give it from Mount Sinai, from on top of the mountain where they could hear it, but he wanted to write it here. And by them being fearful and not going up to meet the Lord up the mountain, they were, they were not allowing him to write his law in their hearts. And it's something he's been trying to do from that very time. Write his law in our hearts, which means our motives, our desires, the things we love. He wants, he wants um, those to be in harmony with his law and his character. So let's take a look at uh, uh, just a few verses later, or a few chapters later from Exodus 24. This is the Ten Commandments. Uh, God initially from... Exodus 20, he, he spoke the Ten Commandments from the top of Mount Sinai in the midst of fire. So we just read that. But um, the, the language there, in fact, we used from the top of the mountain, you have similar to, you remember this, the, the first uh, passage we were reading about Lucifer? He was on the mountain in the midst of fiery stones, all those things. The same language is on the top of Mount Sinai. There's the fire. He wrote the commandments, eventually he wrote the commandments where? In stone, okay? His presence was there. So mountaintop experiences are all about um, God as our creator, the one who loves us and cares for us, but he, the way that he governs and he is a, is a benefactor to his creation. And so part of the law giving there was his, his government, his, his implementing of of not only who he was, but his laws. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Exodus 24, a few verses later. Then Moses went up, also Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone. And it was like the very heavens in its clarity. Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and be there, and I will give you tables of stone and the law and commandments which I have written that you may teach them. So now God is saying, I didn't just, just give my law in an oral sense from the top of the mountain. I'm now going to give you tablets of what? Stone. Remember we talked about Lucifer walking in the midst of the fiery stones? This, this, these stones are absolutely connected to uh, the law of God. 
And that's another reason we know why Satan rebelled against not only God, but his law specifically. So here what we find is God is sitting on, or his feet as it were, were on paved work of sapphire stone. In the very next verse, God says, I'll give you tables of stone. Where is he going to take that stone from? If God's sitting on stone, where is he going to get the tables of stone from? From where he was, from where he was seated on his throne, which tells us that his law is the foundation of his throne. So when he he hews out these tables of stone, they come from sapphire. That's why I believe they're more blue in nature than they are just stone colored. Uh, and you can find this. Uh, where I'm not the only one that is um, uh, that has this opinion. I received this from others who have taught this very same thing, and I think they're accurate in that uh, the Ten Commandments were um, were made out of sapphire, the original ones at least, that God hewed out and were then given to, to Moses. All right, let's do this. Let's, it's, it wouldn't be good to go through this teaching without at least looking at the Ten Commandments, right? So let's just take a look at, at those here from Exodus chapter 20. And we'll just read through uh, verse 17, which is uh, where the Ten Commandments end. All right. It says, and God spoke all these words. Okay, so he's on the mountain, midst of the fire and the thunder that's happening up on the mountain. And here's what he says. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Notice that the first part of the Ten Commandments was this preamble. I'm the one that's about to proclaim this to you. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of where? Brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. How many of you have heard people say and teach in the Christian faith, amongst various faiths, that keeping the law is bondage? It's very prevalent, actually. Uh, that Jesus did away with the law so we wouldn't be in bondage anymore. That's why Jesus' death, he died for us, to get rid of the law. This is their interpretation, of course. It's inaccurate. To get rid of the law so we wouldn't be in bondage anymore. How inaccurate is that? Because we have God who is saying, I'm the one that brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Therefore, and then he gives them the Ten Commandments. He wouldn't be saying, I brought you out of the house of bondage and I'm going to put you right back into it. The Ten Commandments aren't bondage. The Ten Commandments provide a a transcript of what it means to be free. So that's the first thing we've got to remember. The Ten Commandments are about living a life of freedom in Christ and and one in harmony with God's law. And then we have, of course, verse 3 which often is brought as the first commandment. Uh, You shall have no other gods before me. And then the second commandment, you shall not make yourself a carved image or likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. Okay, so this is God who is saying, don't have any idols that you bow down to or worship. Now, some people take this to the nth degree and they say, you shouldn't have a picture with an image of any likeness of anything. Or you shouldn't have any, you know, carved little dolls or something on your mantle or something like that because that's, that becomes an idol. No, idols are something that people worshipped. They bowed down to these things. They believed they had special powers. That's what God is talking about. He's not talking about your picture on the wall. So we're not to have any other gods before him. That's the second commandment. And the third commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. So what is that? What is taking the name of the Lord in vain? Yeah. Yeah. So it's more of a depth of meaning than just using God's name as a curse name or a curse word or using it even frivolously, just, you know, speaking of him in a very um, um, flippant manner. Like in a colloquial, you just put your finger on the Bible and then swear to, you know, uphold. 
Well, law. yeah, and, and there's no law against oaths, taking an oath. Uh, just recognition that oaths are very serious for the follower of Christ. Um, you know, I think the deeper meaning to this uh, third commandment is really taking upon yourself the name Christian and living like the devil. Because you become, as Christian, you, you say, I'm a rep- I live, I, I, I act, I speak, I think like Jesus does. And then to go out there and misrepresent him by how you think, live, act, that is kind of a taking on yourself his name in vain. So I think it's more than just cursing. It's just um, not really recognizing that the name of God is holy and Jesus is holy. And that's how we are to receive him into our life, which then becomes holy. Okay, let's look at the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this or even read the whole thing here because our next lesson is on the Sabbath. So we're going to come back to that, okay? But that is uh, nonetheless the fourth commandment. Now, the first four that we just read is in regard to our relationship with God and his relationship with us. The next six relate to our connection, our relationship to others on this earth and them with us. So that's why you find in many depictions of the Ten Commandments, uh, so this would be inaccurate uh, in this respect, but it's hard to find pictures of blue commandments, so (laughs) I did find this. But you would have one, two, three, four commandments on the left side, and you'd have five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, six commandments on the right side. And what the Bible actually says is that each one of these tablets has a reverse side with the other on the back side of it. It's almost like a covenant when, a, when, you, make, when you do enter into a promise to pay or a loan or something like that. They always have you sign something in duplicate. One for them, one for you. God gave one to them, and of course, one for him. And I'm talking about symbolically here. I'm not saying that God literally said, okay, I'm taking this one. He knew what his law was. But simply, I, I think it's a, an interesting way of understanding that this, the Ten Commandments were central to a covenant relationship between the people and, and God. All right, so let's look at the last six. Number five is verse 12, honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Um, Uh, That is the first commandment that has a promise attached to it. That when you honor your father and mother, there's a promise of of blessings that will come back to you. Uh, Number six, you shall not murder. Number seven, you shouldn't commit adultery. Uh, The eighth commandment, you shall not steal. Uh, The ninth commandment, you shall not bear false witness or you shall not lie against your neighbor. You shall not defame your neighbor's character. That's kind of an expanded version, I would say, of of that uh, and its meaning. And then number 10, you shall not covet your neighbor's house or your neighbor's wife or male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. So you shall not covet. So those are the Ten Commandments. And you find that they pretty much cover all the basics of life. Not only our relationship with God, but our relationship in connection with others. And um, so, so that's it. Any questions on those? Yeah. Okay, covet would be um, consumed by want for what someone else has. Um, you don't have it, but you see someone else has it, so you, you want it for yourself. It's kind of like almost the beginning of the road you don't want to go down that leads to a lot of unhappiness. Um, And he's saying, so don't covet. In other words, don't just be looking at what everybody else has and desiring those things. Focus on contentment within what you have, what God has given you. Um, And we know God has blessed each and every one of us to a different measure and in different ways. Uh, But covet would be this... this, uh, uh, desire, this, this almost a earnest desire to have what someone else has because you don't have it, so you desire that. And uh, it will lead you to places that you don't want to go because then you're looking at thoughts of stealing and thoughts of other things that I think 
are good. I also think that uh, if you want to understand or how, how gambling ties into the Ten Commandments, that would be it. I think gambling ties into the Tenth Commandment. Because when you gamble, what do you want? You want riches, right? I don't think anybody gambles and just says, you know what? I just want enough to be able to buy a lunch or dinner or some food. People are in it because they want to make some big money. And, they, and, and when you get something, you want more, right? And it's a never-ending cycle of want, 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 want. And that's what coveting is really all about. It's want rather than just allowing God to give you what, what you need. Okay, let's take a look, this transition here now to, uh, to a little different topic, uh, God's law and sin. Because what we have seen is, um, is the essence of God's character. Uh, the character as, as uh, the law being a transcript of God's character, who he is, his essence. That is what he is trying to write on our hearts. He's trying to change our character. Uh, and we'll look at that passage here in just a minute of, of God writing his law on our hearts. But what does that mean for the sinner? One that has committed sin against God. Well, Paul has some things to say about that. We'll read this first passage from Romans chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. He says, Now we know whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. In other words, the term here, under the law, is, is talking about under the, what the law speaks to those who are sinners. So, in other words, if, if you're a perfect human being and you've never sinned and only one person has ever done that and that's Jesus right unless you're absolutely perfect and then that means you're a sinner the sin that you commit then puts you under the condemnation that the law gives because the law requires perfection here's here's what the law is here's God in his perfection and his holiness that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become what guilty before God so none of us is innocent uh, we've all heard the term, oh, I'm, I'm a good person, I don't do anything bad. Well, you're still guilty because if you commit just one sin, you're still under guilt before God. And, and I don't know of anybody that's just committed one sin. I think most of us would confess that we've committed lots of them. It says in verse 20, then, thereby, therefore, by the deeds of the law, no, sh no flesh shall be justified or will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Why would the law reveal to us what sin is? So that we're aware, aware when we do it. Okay, so we're aware when we do it. Okay. Um, it, shows the standard. it shows us a standard that we can't measure up to. Because that's, it's God. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's his character. It's his perfect holiness. Um, and we'll see that in, in Paul's next argument as to what he's saying here. So, um, for, the, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. When you look at, as a sinner, when you look at the law, you realize you are a sinner because you have committed sin against God. Now, I would add, though, that that's the first step in recognizing our need for a Savior, right? If you don't, if you disregard the law entirely, there's, there's nothing to pronounce you guilty. There's nothing that says, I'm a sinner. If the law is no longer applicable, there's, then sin is no longer applicable. D does that make sense? So uh, this whole argument that, well, Jesus came to do away with the law, and that was part of his ministry that he was accomplishing for us at the cross. Well, then if he removes the requirements of the law, then as a Christian, as I follow him, I'm not capable of sinning because there's no law to condemn me. But that's not what Paul's saying, okay? That's not what he's saying. All right, let's look at chapter seven. Same book, Romans, chapter seven, verse nine. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So Paul's saying, you know, without the law, I was alive, I thought I was doing good, and then I saw the commandment. I saw the law of God, and what happened? Sin revived in me, I realized, I'm a sinner, and I died. So it, it condemned me as a sinner. And the commandment, which was to bring life, 
The commandments were a standard of what it meant to live in happiness and holiness in a life that God gives us, I found to bring death because I, anyone that doesn't have Jesus, that doesn't have the, the Savior that lifts us above that and has accomplished and fulfilled this perfect keeping of the law for us, we are nothing but condemned. But that's why Paul says in chapter 8, and I'm jumping ahead, I don't have this passage, but it says, now therefore there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. It's not there's no condemnation because there's no law. It's that there's no condemnation because we are in Christ, and Christ perfectly kept the law. And that makes us righteous because he gives us his righteousness. But we ourselves, we are sinners. There's nothing we can do about that. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and it and and by it killed me. Therefore, the law is what? Holy. And the commandment is holy, just, and good. See the declaration there? The, the commandment is perfectly holy and just and good. It came from a loving God with a perfect character. But I'm not. And because I'm not, does it make the law bad? It makes me in need of a Savior. All right? I like the way that uh, Ellen White puts it in the, this article from Signs of the Times. She says, The Lord has given his holy commandments to be a wall of what? Protection around his created beings. So in other words, he in his intention is that the law would protect us from a, uh, or provide a protective barrier from sin outside of, of what it is, is giving us or what it says. So in other words, thou shalt not steal. That is protective. It's to help me understand that if I, if I steal, my life will go downhill very quickly. So if I decide, if I choose a step outside of that commandment, outside of the wall of protection, there's nothing that God can do. I can freely choose that, but what's gonna happen to my life is I become a thief. I start going downhill, and eventually I get caught and I get thrown into prison. Kind of another analogy that uh, the law keeps us free. The law doesn't throw us into bondage. Uh, in fact, what society, uh, even in our, our uh, town here in, in the Phoenix area, uh, metropolitan Phoenix area, those that are keeping the laws of the land are the ones that are free. It's those who break the laws of this land are the ones that are put into prison. It's the same, same idea with, with God and his government and his law. Um, law keepers are free. Law breakers are the ones that are under bondage because they're under bondage to the judgment that comes from the law against those that transgress it. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it killed me. Uh, in other words, um, sin has this image in the Bible as crouching at the door ready to, to, to get us. So sin is going to take a sinner down, those that are susceptible to it. And we're born in iniquity. We learn, from, uh, uh, we learn sin very easily from just being passed on from our, our parents. So what happens is you're, you're walking along, and you think everything's fine, I'm a good person. But then what happens? You run into the truth about the Ten Commandments and the truth about God's law, and you realize, wait a minute, I'm, I'm not as good as I thought I was. In fact, the Bible says the heart is deceitfully, is desperately wicked. Who can know it? We don't even know it. But coming into view with the commandments, we find that sin had once deceived us but the commandments have killed us. In other words, they pronounce us guilty and by virtue of that being put on death row. Okay, yeah. Well, uh, it, well, the law of God was there for them. So that it's a misnomer that the 10 commandments as transcribed and written in stone didn't happen until he gave it to the Israelites. But the law, that's why I read the, the verse previous to that where it says Abraham obeyed God's laws. Eve knew what God's laws were. And yet she was 
deceived by sin. And therefore, what happened? It killed her. So that's all that Paul is saying. He's using some very uh, strong language to say what sin will do to us. But once we run into the law of God and we see ourselves for who we are, even though it kills us, we have a savior. See, that's the whole thing. Paul is giving us our current situation, but then he's leading us to who? The answer for our problem, our hopelessness, and that is Jesus. Okay. A transcript of God's character. You hear me mention this several times. Let's read a passage that reveals this very thing. This comes from Exodus chapter 34, verses 1 and 2. It says, The Lord said to Moses, Cut two tablets of stone like the first ones, Uh, If you don't know what the story was, the the commandments that God gave him that he cut out of the stone from the foundation of his throne, Moses brought down, and when he came down, he saw the people had built a golden calf, and they were rebelling against God. And what did Moses do? Do you remember what he did with the Ten Commandments he was holding? He threw them down, and they shattered. They broke. Okay? He threw them down with such force. Uh, I think God was in there somehow too because God's I think God's perspective on that whole thing what he was telling us is is the covenant the very covenant I made with you and I and me is broken okay so uh, then he has to say to Moses okay come back up (laughs) cut out two more commandments tables of stone like the first ones and I will write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke So be ready in the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. So he cut two tablets of stone like the first ones. Then Moses rose early in the morning and went up Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and he took in his hand the two tablets of stone. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Now notice, what is God going to do? Why did, he, why did he have Moses come up the mountain? To be given the commandments, to write them on the tablets of stone that, that Moses cut out, right? So Moses arrives, and the first thing God does is he proclaims his name. Now, names in the Bible are always tied to character. They name their children after their characters. Um... Uh, People are renamed because of their characters, we even find in Scripture. God gives us a new name when he changes our life. And you'll have, did you know you'll have a new name in heaven? You will not be Jeff. You will not be Susan. You'll, be in, you'll have another name. Well, it's, it's tied, that's tied, yeah, it's tied to that, yeah. So, um, so yeah, we don't know what that name is, but I can tell you that that name will be tied to who you are, your character. It'll be a good name. You'll love the name. So he says, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the name of the Lord. He said, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious. Notice he's giving his characteristics. Merciful and gracious, long-suffering, which is patient, and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin. Now, isn't that a faithful, loving God that is like that? But notice this. He goes on to say, by no means, though, doing what? Clearing the guilty. In other words, if they're guilty, he doesn't just say, ah, well, you're okay. He doesn't just clear them. He's a God that is a God of justice visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. And then notice in hearing this, Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth, and he did what? He worshiped. Yeah. Oh, iniquity, uh, here's the shortest answer. Iniquity is a type of sin. It's more of a, being in a state of sinfulness. Iniquity is a inner sinful condition. Uh, if we had time, we could go into, you know, the different kinds of sin. I think there are three kinds of sin, iniquity, transgression, sin, and they all mean slightly something a little different, but just for the sake of what we have here, iniquity is sinful. Yes, sinfulness. 
All right, so Jesus is revealing his character as the lawgiver. He's telling Moses not just the Ten Commandments, not just writing them down for him. Moses has already heard him. He's giving them who he is and what his character is behind his giving of the law. So what about Jesus and the law of God? So we find that uh, it says in Isaiah 4, 21, 42, 21, the Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will exalt the law and make it honorable. So the Lord, and this is a prophecy of the Messiah who was to come, right there in the middle of, of the book of Isaiah. It's a prophecy of, the, of Jesus who would come, who would magnify the law and make it honorable again, respected, loved. The, all, there's a lot in that word honorable. Uh, it says also, go ahead. Okay, so in the middle of the book of Isaiah, you have these little encapsulated um, uh, statements about the Messiah and what his, his role would be when he came, what he would do when he came. And this is one of those, boop, right in the middle, inserted in the book of Isaiah, one of many of them, where he says, the Lord is well pleased for his righteousness. In other words, he is going to, it, it pleases him to, to show and reveal his righteousness to the people. He, that is the Lord, will exalt the law and make it honorable. In other words, he will bring it up to a standard that is its proper place. It will not be misunderstood. It will not be maligned. It will be exalted as it should be. Looking forward to Jesus, yes. It's a prophecy of the Messiah and what are the things that he would do when he came. Uh, no, that was that was uh, that was after his baptism. It says, "This is my beloved son, in who I'm well pleased." Yeah, yeah. And we find another one. Uh, these are also uh, appear in the Psalms. And so, in Psalm 40, verse 8, we find this about the Messiah: "I delight to do Your will, O my God, and Your law is where within my heart." So, another thing about Jesus and the Messiah and and what He would declare during his time that he's on this earth. I see you have another question there, Susan. You're... Uh, in the place that it sits, okay, so uh, it, is about, it is about David, the psalmist. But where it sits in there is this, it's just, it's, it screams Messiah. I can't tell you any other way. People... Theologians that look at this say, this isn't just about David. This is about the Messiah to come. It's like um, uh, the terms, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Have you heard that term, that, that phrase? Do you know that's from the Psalms? David spoke it. But Jesus spoke it too. So in many respects, David is saying something that Jesus says. That's why I say it's a, it's a little nugget of the Messiah to come and what he will say, what he will do, what, he will, what will be in his heart. Yeah. So you see this repeatedly throughout the Old Testament. Jesus using the same language of the Old Testament writers. And when he uses that language, he's basically saying, they said it because it pertains to me. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. When I read that, I wouldn't know who was saying it, but I would think while reading it, that pertains to me. Well... Yeah, I mean, it does. That's the intention. Because Jesus is our example. He's our Savior, but he's also our example. He wants to put the law in our heart and write it there. But Jesus came with the law written in his heart. Okay? And so he had no, what was the word? He had no propensity, no desire for evil, for sin. Sin did not attract him. It, repel it repulsed him. And that's, that's the condition, that's the nature, the nature that he had and he wants us to have. So when he converts you from sinner to righteous, he's putting a new desire in you and that law is written on your heart and now you, sin repulses you now. And Christ claimed them as his own. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. That's good. You said it better than I did. Yeah. And you find this with David. You find it in Isaiah. You find it in Jeremiah. There are several places. 
Um, in fact, if you Google the prophecies of Jesus in the Old Testament, you'll find a hundred of them, and they're, they're all throughout. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to have to go because I'm, I'm getting close to finishing up. I'm uh, needing to be on the platform here. Um, Jesus says in Matthew 5, Do not think I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to do what? Fulfill the law. So what does fulfill mean? To fill up. What is he saying here? I came to magnify the law. In fact, on the Sermon of the Mount, when he met with all the people, he said, you say that if you commit adultery with a woman or you sleep with a woman, that that's, that's transgressing God's law, that's sinful. I say that if you even look upon a woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed sin. That was, that's a magnification of the law. The law says don't commit adultery, and people say, oh, I didn't sleep with her, but they did everything else. And he's saying, no, that doesn't cut it. If you lust after anybody else, that's committing adultery, even the thought. So that's the magnification of God's law, and it deals with the heart issue, uh, absolutely. It goes on to say there in this passage that whoever uh, breaks one of these commandments and teaches men to break them, which I, we see even in Christianity today. The law's not, it's done away with, doesn't matter. That's like teaching someone they, it's okay to break the law, um, that uh, they'll be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, I'm going through a little faster here because I didn't realize that we had such little time left, but here's the passage of writing the law in our heart. It comes from Hebrews chapter 8 and involves the new covenant. And it says, for the if the first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, this is Jesus speaking, finding fault with who? With them, that is the people. He says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. In other words, not the old covenant that I found fault with them on, but a new one. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they didn't continue in my covenant. And I disregarded them, says the Lord. Those are the ones that were in it, the wilderness for 40 years. And remember, said God said, I would let an entire generation pass because they rebelled against me. And then I would take a new generation into the land of Canaan. And that's what he's referring to there. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and I will write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. And then notice this. This is, what, this is the experience then of having the law written in your heart. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. How many times have we seen people run around and they say, that's not good, that's bad to do. God would not be pleased with that. I even hear this in children's stories. You know, if you're good, then God will, will favor you and God will do good things. But if you're bad, be careful because then you're out of God's will. Now, in essence, there's some truth to that. But that kind of motivation doesn't really get you anywhere. Because if you know the Lord... You're trying to know him from an outward perspective. In other words, you're trying to know information about him. It's entirely different to know the Lord inwardly and experience him in your relationship, in a deeper connection. And so what he's saying is, no one will run around to his neighbor and his brother saying, you need to know God because they're all going to know me experientially from the inside out. For I will remember, be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Notice this then, verse 13, the last part. In that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Uh, now, obviously there's, I can't, don't have the time to get into the two types of, co um, of covenants here, uh, old and new covenant. Um, but just quickly to, to mention, Paul uses language the language Old and New Covenant to refer to two different things. Sometimes he's talking about the historical system of the Old Covenant, which is the law of Moses and ceremonies and all the things, the sacrifices and all that. But other times he's speaking of an experiential covenant. 
And that's what he just finished speaking about here in Hebrews chapter 8. The experience of the new covenant rather than the old. The old is about, boy, I better keep this law because if I don't, God will be upset with me. To a new, which is, oh, I love Jesus and I'm so close to him and he, spends, he, he, he cares for me and he watches over me and he's changed me and I want to keep his law because he's changed me from within. That's the difference between old covenant and new covenant that is speaking of here. All right, I don't have time to cover the rest of this. It's almost over um, or the end where we have questions and I have time maybe for a question or two if you have one. You good? Yeah. I don't want to rush you. I, we were at about 10 tail and I said, oh boy, if I don't start this thing. Uh, Jeff got here and I was by myself. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. I'm, uh, this, the, the purpose is dual here. It's to provide a teaching forum for, for our church and our church family, but it's also to be able to then upload and put it on a website so others can learn from it as well that aren't necessarily here in the church and maybe are exploring. So um, so now you know, the, for those of you in, who are viewing this by video, that's uh, one of the, the two reasons actually why we have this class. Yeah. Question, Susan, or does that hopefully we, okay, fantastic. Well, let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your love for us and your grace in our lives and the law that you have given to the entire world, the universe for that matter. Lord, you have transformed us to be keepers of your law. You have put your law within our hearts. And we pray, Lord, that we would always give you that love and that uh, commitment out of, um, out of the love and relationship with you. And so we pray that you would continue to transform us, to make us new, not to be just the author of our faith, but to finish our faith so that we can become eternally prepared to, to live with you forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, God bless you and have a great Sabbath. Thank you.